Okay, so I think uh, we can start. So uh, in the last session, uh, I presented, I tried to convince you that uh, people are highly sensitive, so ex uh, feedback or experience does not ensure maximization, but it does predict, uh, it does impact behavior in a predictable way. But uh, we ended with four open questions that I will try to address in the current uh, session. Uh, as I said, uh, one of them is my results show that, uh, that experience trigger underweighting of fervent, but there are real life phenomena like uh, gambling in which or buying lottery ticket in which people overweight fervent, appear to overweight fervent. And I said that experience uh, eliminate loss aversion, but there are situations in which people uh, behave as if they are loss averse in natural setting, like under investing in the stock market. And then I try to argue that people behave as if relied on small sample and I didn't explain why. And then uh, I, the uh, most important question, as I already said, is how general are these results? I only show you how people react to, uh, to numerically presented gamble. Is that also true when you present them verbal nudge? Do we get, do the reaction to verbal nudge is similar to the reaction for gambles? In order, uh, so I'm gonna, in this session, I will try to address all these open questions, and I'm gonna use uh, the following simpler experimental paradigms that I used so far. In this experimental paradigm, there is no description at all. The subject come to the lab and we tell them, and nowadays we run this experiment, of course, on the web. We tell them this experiments include many trials, your, your task in each trial to click on one of the keys, uh, and uh, your payoff will be determined by, the, by your outcome. After each click, you see some payoff. This will be your payoff over the trial. By the way, we run this experiment for paying them for one randomly selected trial, but we also ran it uh, in which the, the earn points, and the points determine the probability of a, ga of a monetary gain, of a bonus. This is easier to do in, uh, in, uh, in the internet, uh, this method. And uh, we get basically get the same kind of results. We also get very similar results when we run the experiments in the in the Technion or when we run it, run it in cloud research. But you don't tell them anything about the... In this experiment, we don't tell them. In the, in the experiment I presented in the previous class, we told them everything. We basically get the same kind of results. Uh, but I will present some exceptions. So in this experiment, for example, I select right in the first trial and I get the feedback, you selected right, your perf in this trial is one, had you selected left, it would be zero. And then I select right again, and I get the same, in this case, the same kind of feedback. So this is an experiment. So the question is, how people learn in this setting? So there's no description, we only look at the pure effect of experience. And, uh, okay, so this experiment was <coughs> run for 100 trial. Here is, uh, results that show you the, the tendency that I already showed with description, this time without description, that the people uh, behave as if they're underweight or urban. Uh, as you see here in the dark problem, uh, this lottery, uh, this ex the dark experiment, one key always give or maintain the status quo, the other one led to a loss of 10 in 10% 10 of the trial, and to a gain of one otherwise. So the expected value was negative, but they selected 60% of the time. In this condition, in the dark condition, the lottery has positive expected value. It leads to a gain of 10 in 10% 10 of the time, a loss of point as well, and people select it only 30% of the time. As I said, these results can be captured by a simple model that assume reliance on small sample. Here is a model. Uh, here is a simple version of the model without any gen overgeneralization. In this model, the subject uh, just where we are now in trial 71, the subject recalled five past experiences, not necessarily the last one, and, uh, and select the option that led to the best outcome. In the dark problem, if you do that, uh, you will select the lottery as long as uh, your five experiences did not include a loss of 10, right? Because if you lose, a, if, you, if it's include a loss of 10, then the lottery will have a lower expected value. But if all, four, all five experiences had, are, are you remember of getting the outcome plus one, then you will select uh, the lottery according to this model. The probability that, the, that if you select five that it will not include a minus one is 0.59. And this is more or less what our subject did. 
So this result can be captured by this simple model that you just randomly select five experiences and select the option that had the better outcome. Yes? Were subjects told explicitly that the mechanism behind the bees stayed the same, or are they, or uh, is this just like in, in this experiment, we told them nothing. But notice that we got a, almost the same result in the experiment in which we actually told them the pair of distribution. And later I will show you some experiments where we gave them different verbal description. So this result is really, really robust. We get it on very different experimental paradigm. I have to admit that I, I did not predict it ahead of time. I used to think that people will learn to maximize, and I was really surprised by these results. But uh, I, you know, I got this result first time 20 years ago, and we replicated it in many, many experiments. So this result doesn't make sense, but it's robust. Okay, and in this situation, the probability, uh, if you run sample of, uh, of uh, five, the probability that you will select the risky option is 41%, and the subject more or less behaves this way. So this result suggests that people will, they deviate from maximization in the direction of underweighting of error event. Nevertheless, the same model also predicts that there are situations in which people will gamble. Uh, to think about that, think, think about uh, 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 how it's a real life. Assume that you're a manager. Here is a cover story. You're a manager and you want your, your supervisor to do, your workers to do something uh, and you want to give them a bonus. When it will be better for you to give them a lottery bonus than give them a, a deterministic bonus? This is a question. And the, my, my point is that it will be good to give them a bonus, to give them a probabilistic bonus, to give them a, a lottery, if uh, you want to encourage them to do something that is not good for them. And here is an example for a situation that you get this effect. Think about uh, the following two experiments. In both uh, options here, subject had to, in the dark problem, subject had to select between 12 for sure, or a prospect that give you 11 for sure. That is 10 plus a bonus of one. Okay, a model that assumes relies on small sample will never select L, will only select H, because all past experience, 12 is better than 11. But if you are in this case, and you are the manager, and you could change the bonus instead of having one for sure, give a bonus that, give to, that lead to a gain of 10 with probability 0.1. Now, if subject rely on small sample, once in a while, the sample will include the plus 10, it will go up. And this is more or less what we get in the experiment. So in the experiment, without, without uh, with a deterministic bonus, they don't like to select the 11, they prefer 12. Proportion of selected 11 is only 10%. If you now give a, a lottery, then the proportion of selecting this promoted option goes up from 10% to 22%. I think sometimes people are getting confused. I think that many situations in life in which people buy lotteries could be something of that, and not that you always buy lottery. According to this model, we buy lottery despite the low expected value, because once in a while we feel lucky. And maybe some people have this problem in their head and they always feel lucky. So my point is that it could be that the fact that people buy lotteries is not a preference to buy lottery all the time, but because we rely on small samples, sometimes lottery with negative expected value <coughs> as real life lottery, sometimes they look, they look good. And maybe some people it's always look good for them because their sampling process is not as random as I presented here. Yes? Do you know if they really focused on the recent? Uh, I will show it in a minute. But I'll give you a, 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 a it hint. It's time. not the recent. What? It's not the recent? No. We will, in a minute, we'll talk about this. this is the next topic. But now let's talk about the, thang, the things that really bother me. Uh, the coexistence of, uh, of, uh, of loss aversion and uh, extreme risk taking. So I wanna, uh, here is an example in which our model, we don't have to change anything. Our model predict, predict, uh, uh, predict, um, reverse loss aversion bias. Now in this example, you have to select between a status quo that give you, so we have three alternatives now. You have to select between uh, status quo that give you zero for sure, or a risky prospect that, that lead to a gain or a loss of four, 
or a, list, a risky prospect that lead to a gain or loss of eight. High risk or just risk. And what you see here is a proportion of people selecting the status quo. It's only 12%. Now, the trick here that uh, two risky prospects are negatively correlated. So one, uh, when one, uh, uh, one goes up, the other uh, uh, goes down. So when, when uh, high risk give eight, the low risk give minus four. And when high risk give minus four, uh, the low risk give, you give four. Now there are many situations like that. For example, index fund has this property, right? Index fund gives you the average of two of, of, of alternative stocks, so it's never the best. One of the stock is always better. And the tendency of many people, including myself, not to buy index fund but prefer individual stocks is consistent with this pattern. <coughs> because if you rely on small sample, you never experience a situation that the status quo is the best. Right? Because that's for one of the two risky options, because they're negatively correlated, will, uh, will, uh, will always be better. Right? So in this situation, you get, uh, you get people behave as if they exhibit a reverse loss aversion bias. And it's perfectly consistent with this model that assume reliance on small samples. Yes? Something I missed. How do they pick up on the No, no, no. We get full feedback after oh, each trial. After feedback. each trial, if sorry, you if sorry. you don't if you don't give a full feedback, then you don't get this effect. Okay. okay. So situation. So this model, you don't have to assume overconfidence or you know like the common explanation for why people indivi uh, prefer individual stock or overinvested in uh, in uh, or exhibit uh, under diversification is explained by overconfidence. You don't have to assume overconfidence. You can call that overconfidence. But this is a property of reliance on small sample of past experiences. Yes? Uh, the, the line, <coughs> the red line, is that high risk or just a risk? This is a risk. In this experiment, for some reason, we don't understand it. We also have, this is something that happened now in the internet. People in the internet are really like risk more than you could predict. And what about the high risk? What? So the high risk was even higher. Because the sum is, is one. And what happens when you have a positive correlation between the, uh, between the two risky options? When high risk give, when risk give four, high risk give eight. When uh, uh, risk give minus four, this one give uh, minus eight. Now we get people behave as if they are loss averse. And the same model captures this pattern. Why? Because now the risky option is never the best. If you are lucky, you better go for the high risk. If you, are, uh, if you are unlucky, you should go for the safe. In this case, the safe actually has slightly lower expected value, and it's still selected more than anything. So in this setting, people behave as if they are loss averse, but you don't have to assume a at special attitude toward losses or some reference point. The same model, we launch a small sample, will lead to loss aversion-like behavior here, and in a, and, and uh, Overconfidence-like behavior or overtrading here. This can also explain the overtrading that uh, Professor Alman discussed earlier. That now you you know over time you think that different risky prospects is going to be better next trial, so you overtrade. But this is not about because of risk attitude. This is just by the same model assuming reliance on small sample, and the model that assume reliance of sample of five is is just fine capturing this thing if you just add a little bit. Of course, it's predict here uh, zero percent, so we don't get zero percent. And the way we explain the fact that it's not zero is that you have some overgeneralization. And the high risk would that be a line above the green? Second yeah, line? it will be here uh, above. Okay, so let's try. It, uh, now I'm going to move to the next topic. So why is people behave as if they rely on small samples? So the natural explanation for the tendency to rely on small sample, and this is an uh, explanation that I actually used to believe in the 90s, is that people be, uh, rely on small sample because of some cognitive limitations. So maybe they only rely on the most recent experiences. So the people are lazy, 
so maybe they just, or maybe they think the environment is, some ch is changing very quickly. So what happened yesterday is going to happen tomorrow too. So it sounds like a reasonable assumption. Uh, and this explanation is, is, as I already mentioned, is consistent with, uh, now if you are a real economist and you take your model seriously and they try to learn about the world by estimating parameter of your model, as I tried to do in the 90s, uh, then this is what you want to do. Because when I took, uh, when Al and I proposed a reinforcement learning model and Colin Kammer and Tech Hope presented a EWA model, then when you estimate their parameter, it turns out you find that there's huge recency effect. To capture this result that I've shown you, this model assumes that people are highly sensitive to the, to, the, to the recent outcome. And I used to believe that. But then Al invited me to write a chapter for the Handbook of Experimental Psychology, uh, Economics. And I tried to do better than just estimating parameter, also shows the raw data. I tried to, to, to be like a real scientist. And I was sure we have positive recency. I looked at the data and I couldn't find it. And that was really a shock for me. And this is what's led me kind of give up on the reinforcement learning, fictitious play, uh, EWA slash any uh, models that predict really strong positive recency, but the data did not show it. Uh, two features of the data surprised me. Uh, here is the first one. Uh, in this experiment, this is the same experiment that we showed before. One key always gives zero. And the other key give plus uh, 10 in 10% 10 of the time, minus 1 in the other. Now what I did to, to demonstrate the positive recency that I used to believe in was uh, to look what was the choice rate, uh, assuming that the subject select the risky option at trial T, what he did in trial uh, T plus 1 uh, if, the per, uh, if the perfect T was a gain of 10, and if the perfect uh, trial T was a loss of of one, because the possible perf are either plus one or minus <coughs> one. And to our surprise, I see that after a gain of 10, they selected again 70% of the time, which actually was reasonable. But after a loss of one, they selected again the risky option 80% of the time. This appeared to suggest some, uh, it suggests actually two things. One is inertia. They really like to repeat the same, uh, the same key again. Another one is something like uh, maybe gambler fallacy, that after selecting a 10, I would now, and I should not expect another 10 again. Yes? Yeah, this looks like a paper losses kind of thing, that if you don't execute the losses, then you have not shifted your reference dependent and probably your skill. OK, maybe. Le let me show you another result, then tell me that uh, if it's consistent with your story. How many periods did this go on for? This is 100 trial experiments. By the way, we get the same kind of result if we tell them the perfect distribution or if we do not tell them. This is really, really robust. Okay. And uh, now... Sorry, what was the average risk taking? Uh, in this experiment, uh, the average risk, uh, risk taking was, uh, I just told you, it was about 35%. But there, there was a lot of inertia. Some subjects take risk most of the time. So condition on the fact the select uh, risk at, uh, at T, uh, here, this is what happened after you selected risk at trial T. Now let's look at the guys who did not. Uh, what, what was the payoff if the, if the payoff last period? What, what was the choice if the payoff last period? Well, this is when the perfect last period was 10. If, the, if uh, you selected risk and you earned 10, the probability of repeating oh, selecting right, right, was only 70%. Right. But if you selected risk and the perf was, was uh, a loss of 1, then you selected 80%. Right. Now, what That's happened true. if you selected safe? Let's look at that. So this appeared to suggest negative recency. OK, so maybe what we have here is negative recency. It's really ugly given my model, but well. Let's say uh, this is real life. What happened when, uh, what happened in trial T plus one, what was the risk in T right one for subject who selected safe at T and see that he lost the chance to, uh, to gain 10. In this case, they switched uh, to risk 20% of the trial 
And if the C is a foregone, was a loss of one, they switch only 10, 1% of the trial. So this phenomena imply positive recency. You are more likely to switch to risk after a gain than after a loss. So in the same experiment, we get both negative recency, the, same, the same, su same set of subjects, the same experiment. We get both po negative recency here and positive recency here. How do you explain this pattern? Let me tell you about a, a result that I found interest uh, similar. Uh, you know, there is a really important phenomenon in finance. I'm not a finance uh, expert, but there's a result that a day after large changes, there, there, is a, there is high correlation between the price, absolute price change today and, uh, and the volume of trade tomorrow. What is the common explanation? Yes, there is finance people here in the crowd. I'm pretty safe, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> so there is really complex, uh, uh, really complex uh, explanation for that. Uh, in finance, I think I read one paper uh, that there are three types of trader, uh, noise trader, sophisticated, and, and some other guys. I don't know, to explain this finding. But I want to argue this is similar to this pattern. Uh, and the explanation that I would like to propose, this is actually with a paper with Iris Neveau, the explanation that we propose is surprise trigger change. So what we think is happening here is that most of the trials, the participants just do what they did the previous trials. So we see there is high inertia here. People who select risk in the previous trial, select risk again. People who select safe in the previous trial, they, most, uh, they, they switch to risk only with small probability. So most of the trials, the subject just continue doing what they did before. Now if the result is surprising, they think, now they are thinking, oh, well, something happened, let's think about it. And when they think about it, they might change. Okay? So here, again of change, again of 10 is more surprising, right? Because the average payoff in this experiment is around zero. So 10 is more different than the average pair. So after an, a, a gain of 10, you are surprised. And if you are surprised, there is a chance that you change your, your, uh, change your choices. So 70% uh, of the people uh, keep doing risk, but there is more people that change, 30% here than here, because this is surprising. Here, again, gain of 10 is more surprising. So there are more people who change. 20% and 10%. So this apparent negative recency and positive recency can be captured without assuming anything about recency. It's enough to assume that surprise trigger change. Okay, notice. Yes? No, so here there's no more contribution for the fact that it's you remember in fine small samples. No, no. That's a new rule. That yes, this is a different phenomenon, but later we try to have a model that combines the two. Basically, what we argue, what we, the model that eventually you will propose is that most of the time, so there are three, your three response modes, either an old experience or small set or inertia. But does it matter whether you look at the end of the 100 trial run or towards the beginning? You might no, th this, is, this is pretty uh, robust also. We actually looked at it. It's pretty robust. Yeah, but but. Yes, I think that will change, but not by much. I think that this idea, and this is definitely describe our behavior, that most of the time I do nothing. <coughs> I continue doing what I'm doing. But if something is surprising, I might consider doing something else. So I think this is a general thing, and this is I think also what happened in the stock market. Most of the time, you don't think about your portfolio. But if something really interesting happening, is there a drop in the stock market or an increase, you might consider your, your portfolio, and then you might then it will change. You, it's higher probability that you change when you consider it, when you don't consider it. But how do you reconcile that with what Alan was talking about yesterday, where there seemed to be large, a, a large amount of trading, uh, even though real circumstances 
actually, the, uh, I had a discussion that Gu uh, Huberman, uh, you probably know him, uh, also talking with Arrow. Arrow, uh, a long time ago, told Gu, and I heard about that, uh, that Arrow thought that the most important finding in behavioral economics is overtrading. And this is exactly the opposite of the most important results in behavioral economics. So behavioral economics have some problems. I don't have this problem. Because the reliance on small sample, you know, like this problem with plus eight, minus uh, eight, right? If you rely on small sample, sometimes you think this option is the best, the medium risk, sometimes it's a high risk, and then you will trade. So I don't have problem with this uh, over alternation. We have the over alternation in our experiments. You don't have to assume risk attitude uh, to capture this, this model will capture that. Now let me say, is there is a neuroscientist here in the crowd? Okay, so sorry about that. I have something for neuroscientists to uh, do. I know that I talked about it with uh, Micah, who was here uh, before. Uh, is, uh, in uh, in uh, neuroscience, they, uh, there is a famous result by Schultz that find that in a dopaminergic, yeah, I don't even know how to pronounce that, that in a specific area in the brain, there is activity that is consistent with sensitivity to surprise. And uh, there is a paper by Diane and others that explained that as a, as a proof for the descriptive value of reinforcement learning models. But, uh, but this is one of the reasons why reinforcement learning models are so popular in, in uh, neuroscience, because they assume some sensitivity to surprise, and the br there is some area, according to the reinforcement learning model, when you are surprised, this is when you learn. But this is not what our subject is doing. You know, they are surprised, but this is not when they are moving toward the maximization. They do the opposite. So what I'm suggesting that it could be that these things that we see in the brain, the surprise, uh, the indication for surprise, for detecting the surprise, is not an indication of learning, but an indication of reconsidering. This is what our, uh, our, our results suggest. Of course, I don't know it, but if someone here will become a neuroscientist one day, uh, this is an open question. Yes? Yeah, I don't know if you want to address it now, but if you, and I know there are, there is, uh, there are people who are suspicious in that kind of uh, search direction. To my disaster? No, 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 no. <laughs> to the one I'm going to present. Okay. It's kind of an apology. But did you ask Sam, did you ask the, the subjects how they were? Okay, thanks. This is, this is a really good question. What did they have in mind when they made their yeah. choices? Okay, so here is a, a real good story. A, a, real, a real story to show how stupid I am. <laughs> I'm a, you know, I'm a, a tra I'm wanna, I want to be a pure uh, psychologist who, uh, who only interested in behavior, not in asking subjects. So I never ask my subject. But I had once a research assistant and I run those experiments. And he told me, you know, the subject always says that they discover a pattern. And I said, what stupid subject there is? There's no pattern there. But uh, it took me about 10 years. <laughs> wow, maybe this subject tell us something interesting. I think, uh, and then I get Kineret, who is the co-author of this paper. And she, when she was an undergrad student, she participated in an experiment. She said, I discovered pattern in this experiment. So then I, you know, after 10 years hearing this story from the subject that they're always looking for pattern, Say so, well, maybe this is what the subjects are doing. Maybe they are looking for patterns. Uh, initially, I thought uh, this is a stupid idea, but listening to the subject in this case uh, could <laughs> save me 10 years of research. Uh, the subject really here, uh, sometimes looking for patterns, and this is exactly how uh, I think this results too. But look at the, at the following results. This is the funniest uh, result, and uh, Rava, I think, uh, talked about it a little bit. This is a wavy recency effect. Uh, here what you see uh, uh, this is a problem now with minus 10 with probability 0.1 one otherwise and this is zero for sure and this result we this is for experiment with 100 experiment but this experiment we ran for uh, also 800 and what you see here is a sequence of last payoff from the risky prospect so in this task this was that you lost 10 in the very last trial this is two trials ago, this is three trials ago, this is four trials ago, five trials ago, and so forth. And this is a proportion of selecting the risk again. These, these are all subjects that chose the risky option for the last? No. 
now, now this is just looking at the proportion of selecting the risk as a function of the last perf, independent <coughs> of what the subject did. In the paper, we also break it, but and we have a similar way uh, both cases. When I looked at this, uh, this results, when I first saw this result, I was sure this is a mistake. But then we find it in many other data sets. And this is really a robust phenomenon. Uh, so, I, uh, so basically what you see here, that uh, people are most likely to select the risky option exactly three tries after e suffering a, a, a loss of 10. And they are least likely to select it 10 tries after a loss of 10. When they had a sequence of, uh, of uh, nine uh, different, uh, sequence of, of nine games. And this is really happening in many, many experiments that we look, the wavy recency effect. So how do you explain the wavy recency effect? Uh, anyone thought about it? <laughs> By the way, uh, was a recently a replicated in Australia too. So it's not something, you know, like the water turn out in a different direction in Australia, but the wavy recency <laughs> effect <laughs> is also happening there. Uh, so this, I, just for the young people here, uh, the real economists here, I would never find anything like that. We were just looking at models. Because a model assumes positive recency, and you know, of course, a model that assumes positive recency cannot do any, any of those. My favorite explanation for that is exactly uh, related to uh, uh, Elhanan's question. Uh, I think that the subject are looking for pattern. And the search for pattern uh, trigger that. Uh, a decrease in the sensitivity uh, immediately after a loss, the fact I, this part is trickier. I'm not going to try to explain it. Let's ignore this part. This, this decrease can be captured under the idea that what the subjects are doing, they are looking for, as I said already, they are looking for the most similar past experience, but similarity is determined by the sequence. So if there was a recent loss, uh, loss in the last five trials, they, uh, they have less past experience with a recent loss. Because they have, uh, and now they rely on even smaller sample than if they did not have a recent loss. And when you rely on small samples, the probability uh, that in your sample there will be a minus 10 uh, is lower. So paradoxically, after experiencing a loss, the probability that you will recall past experience with a loss is smaller. This explains this, uh, this decrease. So many times after, uh, after a loss, then you are more, ex you're more willing to, uh, you, you think that it's more likely that now uh, you get a loss. Let me uh, demonstrate it with a simple example that's not exactly that. What would you do in 1216 of the following experiment, assuming that you don't teach statistics for too long, uh, in each row you have to select between top and bottom. Bottom always give you a zero. And top pay minus one, minus one, minus one plus two, minus one, minus one, minus one plus two, and so forth. What would you do in trial 16? Plus. <laughs> top. You go top, right? Now this behavior uh, suggests that you behave as if you say, well, I had 15 experiences, but I don't have to worry about all these 16. I only have to worry about trial 12, 8, and 4. Why? Because they are similar to tri trial 16. They are similar in the sense that they come after three minuses. Now, it's a good thing that you notice that, because this is how we measure intelligence, right? Intelligence tests are basically looking for people's ability to discover pattern. And my argument is that what the brain is doing is always looking for patterns. And this is what drives our, our results. So immediately after a loss in this experiment, you remember previous trial after a loss, and there are not too many of them. And the probability of a <coughs> loss after a loss uh, turned out to be lo uh, lower. So we after immediately after a loss, we are less <coughs> sensitive to the risk of another loss. But again, this part I will not explain today. Uh, we, we have an ugly explanation for it, so I it's not good for economists to hear explanation. So I'll skip that. But it's an open question. OK? Yes. So, yes, go ahead. Could we be people be chasing losses here? Well, like in this particular example on the top, right? It's like, so, so for this gamble, you've just taken a big loss. You're not going to make it up by playing safe. The only way to make it up is to be risky. So you see more risky play. But we get
get a symmetric option after a game. So this is one answer. So we actually have in the paper uh, the opposite uh, a wave, symmetric for gain and losses, so it's not that. And also in this experiment we pay for random randomly selected trial. So it's not, it's probably not that. I think it's really the effort to looking for pattern and some inertia. So this inertia does this and uh, looking for pattern does this. So we actually have in the paper, this is a, a 2015 uh, Psych review paper, Plonsky et al. Uh, we have a model that captures that. But I will not do that because I think there is, uh, I want to direct you to something with clear practical implication. But this do does tell us that the learning process is not about cognitive limitation. The opposite. I think that what we are doing, what people are doing, and this is exactly what typical research in cognitive psychology assume, that all the results reflect, all the deviation from maximization are results of uh, cognitive limitation, I argue this is cognitive sophistication, that the subject behaves as if they rely on small sample, not because they are lazy, but because the brain looking for all this pattern and discovers that only these three trials are similar to the current trial. Okay? Yes, more question? Yeah, I, I'm probably missing something here, but I understand the pattern seeking in the bottom, but I don't see the pattern in the No, my point is that immediately after a loss, you remember previous trials that happened <coughs> after similar sequences. So three trials after a loss, you recall past experience that happened three trials after a loss. You don't have many experiences like that. So you rely on smaller past experiences, and for that reason, in this set of smaller past experience, the probability of another loss is lower. Here, three trials after, uh, after a sequence of gains, you have more past experience of that sort, so there is a higher probability that your sample will include a loss because you just rely on a larger sample. Yes? To, to do some injustice to what you're saying, you're basically saying people are not good with probability. And they're not good with probability because they're constantly looking for patterns. And so when we have to ask them these sorts of quizzes where it is probability, this pattern seeking behavior creeps in and that's what creates in a more positive way, for people, not for me, uh, I think that uh, uh, we were evolved to deal in, an, in, a, in, a, term, in, a, in a stochastic environment, a dynamic environment that change, and I think probability is stupid. You know, what's the probability of a rain? You know, what does it mean? It's looking at the weather. It's not a constant probability. But the real world has yeah. patterns. Yeah, so I think that we... And I think, by the way, uh, this is again from Coffee with Al Roth, that for Neumann, when he presented expected utility theory, I guess initially they presented in an in a appendix, they didn't really want you to think about probabilities. They just wanted justification for cardinal expected, for cardinal utility. And I think that some decision scientists took it too seriously, and then took too seriously prospect theory, find counter example of that. So I think if you really want to understand human behavior, instead of thinking about as, as people that estimate probabilities and then make decisions, we should think about people as something like machine learning algorithms. So the brain is, the underlying process, the decision process are similar to machine learning algorithm than to uh, judgment and decision, to state judgment and decision making. People don't go around estimating probabilities. They just have some intuition and when there are patterns, they're doing the right thing because we are living in an environment in which there are patterns to discover. Some environment, like the stock market, there's not much pattern. Uh, it's approximately um, efficient, not exactly efficient maybe, but looking for patterns in the stock market is counterproductive, but people still do it in the stock market. Yes? So in this specific paper, the Plonsky et al. paper, uh, we assume that in this setting, subjects are uh, using uh, what we call the, the part of, so we use different rules, but one of the rules that people are doing is uh, uh, looking at situation with a simple sample of uh, last five uh, past experiences. 
So I always look at uh, I always look at uh, exper uh, experiments that happen after this sequence G G L G G, and here is I do what do what happened after G G G G G, and that have I much have much more like that than like that. But then it should, but then it should, it should be flat. flat. Yeah, it should yeah. be yeah. flat. Yeah. 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 So some people do a, s a sample of uh, three, some of four, and uh, this is how we capture it. We capture it. Don't worry. But uh, yeah, not everybody exactly five, but but uh, the, we called it, uh, um, it called contingent uh, averaging. So you contingent on something, but different people contingent on other things. And my main point is that could be, be very interesting. And cognitive psychologists always ask me, so what is the similarity people that the similarity rules that people are using? I don't know the similarity rules. I think <coughs> people use very many similarity rules, just like as machine learning algorithm are doing. Right? Machine learning algorithm we say they are ugly because they use many similarity rules, but it works well. Maybe the brain is doing something like that. So I'm not, not exactly sample of five, but one of them will be sample of five, and that will explain this pattern. Now, uh, let's. Uh, if I have, you know, I'm uh, I'm okay with time. If you have more questions, I'm willing to return to that. But let me just say one thing for summary. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that the descriptive value of the assumption that people behave as if they rely on small samples is not because of reliance on small samples, uh, because of cognitive limitation. The other way around is because we are looking for patterns and we find complex patterns. And even after trial 71, when we look at the past and we are looking for complex patterns, we behave as if we rely on average on sample of five. Yes. No, but I told you my story with biking. You know, so in this biking, I only recall two past experiences. But one so of them happened. One of them happened 30 years earlier. So that's a cognitive limitation. No, no, no. This what this what this what you know. How did I s knew to select the? How did I know to select the? The events that happened to me uh, uh, when I was 17, I had to search my memory to, to do that. This is the most similar biking near, near the sidewalk. And uh, how do <coughs> I know to, to know this, this sad story about uh, uh, this account? So you have to search and then to take out. You could call, if you want to call it cognitive limitation, go ahead. But the cognitive limitation people, they thought recency. No, you don't look no, three. About your botany, no, no, I think botany. it's to so discover so this is a sample. Five, would it identify the pattern? No, no, but you discovered it, right? So uh, it to discover it, you have to look at all of them. You cannot yes. just look at the three. That's so the say, point. oh, I see that the three happens uh, again and again and again. That's the point. That's, That's the point. point. That it's they not enough to look just on five. No, this is my point, that they look at everything and they behave eventually they look at everything, search in memory for everything, and then select the option that works the best on these three. But to discover the three, you have to look at all of them. How do you know that, uh, that only these three trials are important? It's because you looked at them and discovered this pattern. And after you do that, then you go back and select the best option in these three cases. Yes, Maya? Memory doesn't have to be the result of systematic search. There are pop-up yeah. uh, phenomena in memory. Yeah, I I don't uh, yeah I I don't uh, I don't disagree. I agree with you this time. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm not sure how this is done, but now I wanna I wanna think like a, a, um, you know like an economist. And my goal is well, I think what economics should do, although I know that many economists do not. By the way, in all the choice of competition that I uh, organize, I never had economists participate. Uh, which is really uh, surprising, right? Uh, uh, so Tom is a. I was going to say, you don't have a cash prize. <laughs> 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 okay, that's true. Uh, but uh, economists are, uh, are not. But I think, you know, for the young economists around here, I think that one way to have a good career is try to create and, and to have a cash prize, right? This I heard when I've learned in Harvard. I'm going to save some of you who do not who do not study at Harvard. I'm going to send you save you a lot of money. Uh, Harvard Business School on one leg is try to create a better world and take a world 
and try to take 2% of the benefits uh, you have for the world. So I think that what we, well, I also want to do it, I'm not sure I, I will be able to do it, but the young people here maybe, is to try to understand how people behave and try to use this insight in order to design mechanisms that will help create a better world. You know, more safe, more uh, uh, less pollution. And what I'm saying here is that this, this assumption, I'm not sure exactly what happened in the brain. I'm not a brain scientist. I'm not even a real cognitive scientist. But I want to be able to predict behavior. And this idea that something for some reason, rely on small sample, not necessarily the last uh, some the last uh, experiences, this helps predict behavior, and this is what won the competition that we organized, and this was also implemented in Tom's uh, model that of course was more complex, but this was a basic driver uh, of, of this idea, that that search for patterns that imply reliance on, uh, on small samples. So let me move now for, an yes. example it's quite clear okay. right you see you, s you you discover a pattern and now so the pattern is that uh, based on what I'm analysis I'm going to now get plus two here no, right? uh, there's so after there's looking for pattern you don't look at the average the average will be negative on top right but you don't need to, s to rely on small samples once you know the pattern by looking at everything well it's example. a it's a now I'm not an, a mathematician or a physicist uh, that I think it's it's the same thing, you know. Relying on pattern and relying on this, relying on pattern imply playing best to apply to the three past experience. I'm not <coughs> saying that people rely on smooth. <coughs> yeah. There are other patterns to be to be uh, observed from from that sequence. Another pattern is that if if you look at a consecutive run of uh, four, there's always a loss. Right. For every run of four. Yeah. A, a run of, so that would that would uh, that would incline you to choose the safe option in sixteen. If you no, how would you do the take any sequence of four? The overall payoff for that sequence of four is negative. Okay, so I'm not going to fight with that. My point is, uh, I'm, I'm not in the business of finding the pattern. <laughs> I'm in the business of saying, if people are looking for pattern, they will eventually behave as if they rely on small samples. This is my hypothesis. And this really simplifies things. And I'm in the business of simplifying things in order to predict behavior. And I'm not a cognitive scientist to find the, the true cognitive model like my heroic cognitive uh, friend. I don't think they can find the true model, the true cognitive model, because the brain is a neural net, and the neural net does crazy things. But sometimes you can find some regularity. And the regularity that I think is most important if what you want to do is to predict economic behavior is this regularity that people will learn to maximize only when uh, the optimal option also is better most of the time. And reliance on small sample will also direct you toward maximization. This is my story. And it's not inconsistent with your uh, hypothesis. So now let's think what happened. OK, so now let's try to get, again, talking about, uh, now I would like to contribute to the research on nudge. Uh, so nudge was for a while very popular, and, uh, and, and for good reason, right? Uh, Thaler, Sunstein research about nudge, they show that sometimes, just with, with, uh, without changing the incentive structure, you could change people's behavior. You know? and the qu but the problem with the nudge research, that with the exception of the default nudge, most of the nudges, uh, when people run, ex run a review, a recent meta-analysis, that try to correct for publication bias, they found that where some experiments, the published experiments, show some positive effect for nudge, the net effect is very small, and some people say not even significant. And some uh, contributors to this literature suggest that maybe the reason is that the experiments that demonstrate the potential of nudge were one-shot experiments, so the nudge basically is built on the research uh, that uh, Aumann presented, that uh, basically short experiments. But if now you want to encourage people to do something, 
you want to them to repeatedly to do this thing, and when it, you want it to do repeatedly, maybe experience will change behavior. So we run experiments similar to the experiments I've shown you, and this is the next choice prediction competition that um, we are organizing. So it's the same kind of experiment, but now we give you some nudge. And the nudge can be, for example, I can tell you that this key prevents losses. Or tell you that this key is safer. So we give you verbal nudge, and now the challenge is to be able to predict the joint outcome of the verbal nudge and the outcome of experience. Okay, so in this experiment, I tell you this is prevent losses. So if I'm a typical subject, I will select uh, this option, and I get a fair feedback. Uh, it indeed prevent losses, I didn't lose, but now I say, ah, shit, I could, <laughs> I could earn one. This, uh, this may maybe not a nudge, this is might be a sludge. Uh, uh, so the I think the reason why the nudge are not as effective as they are, because although Big Taylor really promotes that the government should only use nudge that makes people do better off. But maybe it's not so effective because in real life people are never sure if it's a nudge that's designed to help them or a sludge that's designed to hurt them. So what do you think now? What would you do now in trial number two? So let me, uh, in the first trial here, uh, in this experiment, 90, about 90% selected uh, uh, the prevent losses. What do you think will be the proportion selected in the second trial? as a prevent losses key. Anyone, you are brave, what uh, you predict? 40%. Not bad, it uh, was around 50% in the second trial, so this time I go for the one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't lie. So what I do in the third trial, now I go here. Uh, but the question, what happened after 100 trials of playing this game? Uh, where in this experiment, this is again the, the problem I studied before, 10% of losing 10 uh, and 90% uh, and, uh, of winning one. So the question, what happened and what will be the impact of the nudge and how uh, and whether the model that I propose will also work with the nudge. And this is why I told you that I'm not so interested in the overgeneralization part on BIST because I think that the impact of experience will also work here. The overgeneralization part of this is not relevant here because now the description are very different. But my hope is that although I change the description, maybe the actual learning process will be similar. So let me show you some results. So here is this experiment uh, with three different, uh, this is uh, actually, I didn't use uh, the example from before. Uh, here, when we tell, we say this is when we write this is safe. Initially, we get 90 percent. After the first try, they, they drop. But now I don't. I don't show you the middle of the track. I'll show you in block. So they go down and then they go up again. So they go down just as you said to 40 percent, because they say, oh, they told me safe, but the other one give plus one, and then they go down and then say, oh, yeah, but the other one lead to losses. So they go down to 50 percent. This condition, there was no description, and we get to the regular underweighting of our event. And this condition, we had a sludge. Now, in this experiment, uh, what we, we wrote was always accurate. So the sludge was correct. It's better most of the time. We wrote on this key better uh, most of the time. It is better most of the time. So we see that initially that uh, people really liked it. But then it went up, and there was no big difference. So what you could, but what is interesting is that even after 100 trials, the, the nudge had some effect. So much of the effect of the nudge disappeared after one trial, but something remained on the long term. Not a lot, but something remained. And this is very similar to what happened when we actually wrote down the perfect distribution <coughs> on the key. So my hope is that there is something general here. It doesn't, so the results that I've shown you with the model beast are not a result of the fact that the description was description of lotteries, but for any description, we get the same thing. The description impacts the first choice, and then uh, experience take over. Yes? If you have no description, but you conditioned on the first trial when they choose B, whether they get minus 10 or 1, you also see a difference that lasts for a very long time? No. You don't. You don't. I don't
don't get don't get much prim uh, primacy. So it's not a primacy. It's not a primacy. Here's another funny result. I'm the only person in the world that runs uh, boring experiments like that, but uh, we did it by mistake. Here you have uh, one for sure, and this lottery gives you one with probability 0.930 zero otherwise. Really boring experiment. And we tried two different nudge, better most of the time, and selected by most participants. So this is actually a nudge that in the nudge literature people like. This nudge really doesn't work. Uh, and actually, we have here one participant, and this was run in cloud research, but some participants were, were interested enough to send us email. <laughs> one participant said, I never select what most people do. <laughs> so this, in some respects, slowed down learning, that you tell them, because if we, didn't, don't, we don't give them anything, we get something in between. So this nudge is really not good. And what is interesting, that we get high correlation between the initial reaction to the nudge and what happened after uh, 99 trials. Yes. You talked about a subject's uncertainty about whether there's <coughs> blood loss is blood in laboratories. Do you think that's something just more general that can be applied in reality to where I see a nudge from the government ad or I see some whatever from New York Times or the Christian flag? Would, would, do you think that's something exclusive in laboratory or do you think that... No, no, I think, I think as I already <coughs> said, that in real life when someone tells me something, unlike Maya, uh, what am I is doing well? I'm more skeptical. When someone tells me something, I think why, what, is, what is his incentives? And uh, I know some people that never believe to anyone, some people believe to everything. I'm conditioned, I'm an economist. I, just, I look at the incentives, and I think we, we don't give enough respect to this nice idea in economics, and I don't think that the way uh, Professor Alman wants to give respect to economics is useful. I think about uh, what this, what's a, the, not the utility, what this person is trying to benefit. Um, and if I think they have incentive to tell me the truth, I will do that. But sometimes people don't believe, you know, when the doctor tell you take this uh, <coughs> cheaper drug, uh, it's actually better for you. Most people don't believe the doctor. No, I want the most expensive ones. <laughs> you guys paying, right? <laughs> I think, so, I think the, my insurer wants to save money on me. And people are willing to take risks just to take the more, you know. So I think this is a general phenomenon. Uh, that if you want people to take the cheaper drug, you really have to work hard. OK, so I think, so the question is, how do you uh, encourage people to do the right thing? I, I hope that this research will eventually uh, will help us uh, do something to help in that respect. And here is uh, my model, which is basically a simplified version of, uh, of BEAST. I already said that, um, now this model, you know, like economists, uh, you like to start with something that is reasonable, you know, some, some axioms about rationality. This is uh, a <coughs> data-driven model. So basically, I start with a sample of five models, and then I ask, myself, and this is what I like to do, uh, this is my, um, what I enjoy doing, I say which kind of assumption I should add to the model to capture all the results. And we already collected 101 experimental conditions, that, like the one I showed you, I showed you three or four, five of those. We run many experiments, and, and what I was doing is sitting in front of the data and ask which psychological assumption I should, cognitive assumption, I should add to the model to capture the results. And this is the best model I could find. It's not too complex, but I'm going to organize a choice prediction competition, and I will challenge all of you. Uh, if I get the email, I will send email, but we will be sending many email lists. We we'll challenge people to organize another competition. Hopefully, Tom will not participate with his uh, smart postdocs. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, but in this competition, I'm not sure that data scientists will have a big advantage. Uh, and uh, let me, uh, but, but maybe I'm wrong. So basically, I think that the, the, model, the best model that I could do have three response modes. One is old. Relies on the experience that I care before the current task. And this I got from this subject who said it was nice enough to send us an email. So this guy, he has experience. It's never a good idea to, to rely on what other people are doing. 
So he's not going to do it. If you tell me everybody is selected, most people participated, selected left, he's going to select right. So his past experience is that if everybody do something, it's bad. Yet 65% of the participants actually <coughs> think that it's good. So their initial behavior was in initial behavior in the in the nudge uh, selected by most participants. Most participants, sixty-five percent of the subjects selected it, but thirty-five percent chose not to do it. So and this behavior, uh, I assume, and, and this seems pretty safe because it's the first trial. In the first trial, we have this effect. One nice thing about it is that we can estimate this effect by the first trial. We don't have to waste parameter in it. We can see it from the first trial. Then, uh, the second mode, this is the, mo the main mode that I discovered so far, this relies on uh, experience of 10 in the current task. So you are now in trial number 71. You rely on some trials already happening in the current experiment. And the third one is to explain the surprise trigger change effect, is repeating the last choice. So the model assumes three response modes, which of course would be nice to have only one, but this sounds reasonable. And now what the model does uh, is assume to capture the fact that the effect of the, of the again, sorry, this is more, uh, it's not economics, I know this is ugly post hoc modeling, but this is why I test it on many data sets. To capture the fact that much of the effect, as you said, uh, of the nudge disappear after one trial, but some of it remain to the end, we come up with the following equation. Just, I invented it, it's not uh, anything fancy. This equation that the probability of relying on all past experience is one in the first trial, which helped me do the estimation, right? But then it drops, and drops very quickly, but stay, uh, but never goes to zero. Because some people, even after 100 trial, still say, I never do it. Uh, you told me the description, I'm not gonna do it. So this, uh, the probability in this model, the probability of reliance on all experience is exactly that. Okay, and the nice thing, as I already said, I can estimate the pre-old based on the, uh, the choice written in the very first trial. Because according to the model, here you only rely on old experience, so I know exactly the proportion in the population. And the third assumption is uh, under, uh, the uh, actually, second assumption, under the new module, as I already said, you rely on sample of K, of kappa, right? In the previous model I showed you, kappa was five, but we estimate the parameter for each individual, and we find some distribution. Some people rely on one. The median it was four, but we had large variability. And the third parameter is inertia. And here what we suggest, that the probability of inertia, uh, that our, we are typically, here we do assume, maybe uh, related to Tom's uh, resource rationality, that if I already uh, saw what's happening here, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to think. I'm just clicking. But if something is surprising, I think, and we measure surprise by the normalized gap between the expected outcome and the obtained outcome, divided by the, the, the possible, uh, the highest and the lowest possible effort coefficient. So this is very similar to what Schultz is finding in the brain. Uh, and this is it. This is a model. So we have uh, uh, we have to estimate the first uh, trial from the data, or we can use a GPT or something like that to estimate it. Uh, and then just we have the parameter kappa, uh, this parameter for the for the speed, and then uh, the probability of inertia. So a model with three parameter, I could capture really well uh, the the choice rate and the sequential dependencies in this 101 condition that I. And what we're going to do, we're going to publish the results with this, uh, uh, we're going to run another 100 condition. Uh, we're going to publish 200 condition and our model, and we'll challenge other people to look at the data and try to, to find a better model. And if you guys waste energy on our, on our, uh, on our data, uh, you can of course use them for whatever paper you want to do. And unfortunately to me, uh, some of our data, uh, Tom uh, published paper in science and in other places which we didn't do. Uh, but you are welcome to try to compete with Tom. Uh, by the way, one reason uh, why I, I like to do these competitions uh, is because I think one of the, you know, like there's a lot of problem of cheating in psychology. Uh, 
of replication, not cheating. Some, there are not some cheating, but not a lot. At least we don't know of a lot, but, but the replication prices, crisis, what it created, the fact that now psychology, to publish in psychology, you have to do pre-registration. Pre-registration sounds like a fair thing, but it's not fair for people from poor universities. Because nowadays it's much more costly to run experiments because you have to do pre-registration. It's a pain to do pre-registration, so you really want to make sure that you're going to get significant results. So you uh, run experiments now with 200 subjects, not with 30 subjects like in the past. Uh, so one of the benefits for running this competition is that people from poor universities, hopefully no one of you, uh, will also have some data to that will increase fairness in a in a different way. So all the data from our competition is free on the web, and you are welcome to use it. OK, so uh, this, this is going to be my, uh, my competition. Let me see what I have next. Uh, oh, uh, on individual differences. What you can see here, this is the data from the uh, 2023 paper in Psych Review that we didn't have descriptions. But we asked, so we, this was an experiment that the one with loss aversion and reverse loss aversion. And we estimate the parameter for each individual. And this is a sample size. It was run from one. And this is a proportion of people that fall in each cell. So many people behave as if they rely on a sample of one. But many people rely as if they, if they are actually using fictitious play and using all past experiences. This is a proportion of people that, uh, uh, this is out of a uh, thousand, I guess. Uh, a thousand or a hundred? Maybe hundreds. Yeah, probably hundreds. Uh, so some people uh, rely on all past experience, some on one. The median was reliant on, on a four. And this was the delta parameter. The median was 0.2. Some people behave as if they had a, uh, this delta pr uh, parameter of one. That is, they only rely on all past experience. They never, uh, they never uh, pay attention to what happening in the experiments. And uh, one interesting thing is that we submitted this paper to Psych Review, and the reviewer said, well, <coughs> if you have a model of uh, <coughs> show us that the parameters are robust over individuals. So we try to check that in some of our conditions that we analyze, each participant faced two conditions. And we want to see if the parameters are robust. And the result was that they are not robust. So a participant participated in two conditions. We estimated this parameter in the in one condition and then try to predict the, his behavior in the second condition. And it's turned out that as using the estimated parameter hurt your prediction. It's better to assume that you randomly select uh, something from here. Then, uh, and some, some psychologists say, well, in that case, your model worth nothing. I'm not sure, because our theory suggests that these parameters are not really, uh, well, this is what we learned, that these parameters are not really property of the individual but property of what the subject thinks about the current experiment. So it could be that during the experiment, say, so, oh, I know what's going on. This is one of the situations there's no pattern. I should go with large sample. Or sometimes say, I discovered a pattern, and now he relies on really small sample. So this could be situation specific. I don't think this is our individual parameter. Yes? I never, I never understood. I never understood the, the. I'm sorry. I'm not good in philosophy of science. <laughs> I never understood the, f the falsifying, you know, uh, falsifying uh, thing. I am I mean, in the business of predicting. Yeah. I'm in the business of predicting. You can, if you think my theory is wrong, you should be very easily come up with better predictions than my predictions. So I'm going to publish results for 200 experiments, and then I will run another 200 experiments. And before running this experiment, I will write down my predictions for the next 200 experiments. And if you have a better theory, you will beat me. So I falsific falsification, I, I, I never understood because all models are wrong. What do you mean, you know? So the I, my thing is that all models are wrong. You know, this is box kind of famous thing. All models are wrong, some are useful. This model is rather useful. I can compute, uh, provide useful prediction. I challenge you to come up with more useful models. So it's not going to be a truer model, but it's going to be more useful. 
yeah I think uh, yeah you could call it truer if it's more useful but I don't have to do it I'm I just want to create a better word and take two percent although my daughter says that they don't see this two percent so far but uh, uh, but this is what I want to do I want to be able to predict what will make people be better driver uh, pollute less this is what uh, I'm in, in this business not into finding not into finding what happened exactly in the brain this I leave to neuroscientists okay uh, notice that this uh, this model uh, works the assumption here is that the description only affect your choices in the first trial and will not affect later on so it will uh, well, affect you. It will be additive. So you either use your you either use old experience or new experience. This is that story. Now I want to show you counter example. Okay, so I'm not saying this is a, the true model for the world, and the reason why I'm saying that is because there are real life situation in which the description of the choice task actually will change the strategies you're going to consider. Okay, so I'm moving to a different topic. If you want to ask me more about that, this would be a good time. Because after showing you how uh, promising this approach, I want to show you counter example. But this is not to say this is not useful, just to tell you where the boundaries. Yes? So a question about this approach. You said that uh, people are more likely to stop being inertial when there's a surprise. Yes. I check in the stock market. So in the stock market, one of the interesting things is that the, the correlation between uh, price change today and volume of trade tomorrow is symmetric for both increase and decrease. And also in our experiments, it's pretty symmetric. So I think, you know, maybe it's optimistic, but it's something really... Uh, I so the best model I could find is only look at the absolute difference and not on the... To normalize the absolute difference and not on the direction of the surprise. Yes. By the way, but there is one thing you're correct. If I have one uh, one strategy is much better, the other one is really bad. So one strategy always gives you a, a pair of 10, the other one always leads you to a pair of, of minus 1, and once in a while it's surprising, it leads to a loss of minus, ten, minus 100 or minus 1000. That doesn't count as surprise in our data set. We actually run experiments to test. So you, uh, you're surprised only for uh, if something surprising happening in one of the strategies that you might consider. If you never consider selecting something, you don't notice it. Yes? So, so I feel like your talk is somewhere in between, say, economists who we've heard before that have normative decision theory models and say <coughs> Tom Griffith's talk where we see a good prediction of behavior but not interpret. So it sounds like you have a model that kind of helps you make some explanations of human behavior, and you're saying this model, but you're only interested in it in as much only as much as it helps you predict behavior. But you are assigning some meaning, whereas say Tom Griffiths comes and says, "Okay, I have an uninterpretable model that beats your model." So then, why why do you bother? continuing with your model, it's like you're not saying it helps explain something it predicts something, but then Tom found some better predictor well, it, is, uh, it is my experience that if you have to you know, one of the problems with uh, AI is explainable AI right? yeah. uh, the public don't want to hear something that they don't know, so one way to do explainable AI is to start with a model like me and then improve it a little bit and, and, and admit that this model is just correcting, you know, so it's basically my model plus some addition and more importantly, this really gives an intuition. I don't have to run the model every time. So now when I'm talking with people or if I'm thinking about what's going to happen, I often can give, uh, can give predictions um, that I don't have to run the model. You know, like actually, I talked to some people. I'm consulting to some company who, uh, uh, who try to improve safety for, you know, they have some product for truck drivers. Uh, so then I don't have enough data now to do what is optimal. But from what I'm saying, I, I can tell them, 
Uh, here is the intuition, the truck driver, what you should do is do something like the seat belt. And what is a seat belt? It's something that is better on average and also better most of the time. So when you think about the incentive structure to truck driver, this is a good heuristic. Because the model is simple, so this summary, and, and if uh, Tom will win our next competition, will be an uninterpreted model, but probably the description will be similar to what I've told you. I hope. Of course, it could be that he will use something absolutely different. But if he uses as a, as a main feature uh, <coughs> my model, that will be good. Another reason, and this is more important one, that many time in policy, you don't have time to collect a lot of data. You have to decide what to do next. For example, now in Israel, too bad that uh, Professor Oman is not here, uh, some people think we should change the legal system. How we know what's going to happen? Uh, maybe we don't know. Let's change and see. What if we change it to become uh, the, the, uh, and uh, destroy the democracy? We cannot change back. So it would, would be good if we have some policy to tell us uh, what to do. So if, you, uh, if you're in the business of mechanism design, often you have to develop a product before you have the data. And then models like that will be useful. After we have a lot of data, you can modify it, and, and then Tom's method will work. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I'm not an advocate for uninterpretable models. We, we've developed a few ways to try and make more interpretable models. I mean, so one of them was, like, I think you can think about it as what Ido was describing me just before, which is you have a interpretable model with uninterpretable residuals, right? So you make a secondary model of the residuals with respect to the interpretable model. And that's a way of improving the prediction. So you can say, look, 90% of it is this model. And then we can get the last bits out of you know, having this other thing on top of it. We don't fully understand what's going on there yet, but that's the frontier that we're exploring. And you can also use that then as a means of critiquing the model. So we have a paper on what we call scientific regret minimization, where the idea is you can use an uninterpretable model to figure out what are the things that your model is missing in the data, and what are the things that you should be focused on trying to explain when you're improving your model. So one of the challenges when you deal with these big data sets is you can't rely on just looking at individual data points to critique your model because if you've got enough data, the biggest residuals are just going to be noise residuals. Right? You're going to just have some weird stuff that happens with low probability. And so you can use an uninterpretable model to smooth out the data and to tell you, okay, here's a data point that the uninterpretable model can predict, but my interpretable model can't predict. And that's the thing that I should be focused on when I'm trying to understand what's going wrong in my model. So I agree, and I want to give you another example. So in this, uh, uh, in the, my effort to help this uh, startup that work with, uh, with truck drivers, so the question is, what kind of uh, feedback you should give the truck driver? And one thing that, and now this guy, this is a startup firm. You know, if they are successful, they are successful. If they are not successful, they are dead. So they run some, uh, they fund some truck uh, companies that are willing to, to try their product. And if it's successful, then they might do well. If they are not successful, you know, they have one trial and they don't have enough data. So now you have to think, and for example, one advice that I gave them, say, if you will give the driver, uh, and they, they have data from a system like Mobileye that measure how good the driver you are. And based on what we suggested, we said, but if you will give them, uh, and, and now tax, uh, the truck uh, company have don't have enough driver, so they want to give s uh, significant bonuses to workers. So the question, how to use the data from Mobileye and other and similar system uh, to give feedback to the drivers? And one idea, just look at the, at the average payoff you got. So, so Mobileye give you red point, each red point uh, for getting too close to another, another car, reducing point for each point. So that sounds like a reasonable idea. But if you believe in reliance on small samples, this will not work well. And the reason why it will not re, uh, work well, because if the driver nowadays drives somewhere in the desert, he's not closing to anyone, but he drives like crazy, he gets a lot of good points because uh, he's not close to any other truck. And if you drive in, the, you have to go to supermarket in the city, you will lose points. So. Uh, this relentless small sample will say, oh, this doesn't matter how I drive. Sometimes I get a uh, good point, sometimes I get, I get uh, so the system doesn't work well. So in order to, uh, and the idea that I propose, help, I, what I told them, make sure that if the subject, if the driver do the right thing, they get, they will not uh, regret it. 
right? And one way to do it is to normalize the, and then they use machine learning to try to do the normalization because they have data on that, uh, but they don't have data on the driver behavior. So the driver behavior they need economic theory. So a good question for young people is, given the fact that you guys are gonna compete with computer scientists or data analysts, and you guys are gonna be economists, so one idea is to join them. But if it's too late for you to join them, then think where is our relative advantage. And I think our relative advantage is in mechanism design. Okay, this is really important. Traditional econometrics sometimes don't do mechanism design, and this probably, we don't, you don't have a big relative advantage. How much time do we still have? Okay, so let me just show one counterexample. And the counterexample <coughs> basically is the optimistic view that we can have a good model that will have good prediction. This is in a situation in which the description does not change the strategy space. I want to show you an example in which this does not hold. And uh, this is more as a counterexample to know what to worry about. Think uh, about the following uh, task. What we want to do here is to predict the impact of, the, of a warning, which is an example of a nudge. Uh, in this experiment, there were three condi six conditions. Uh, and uh, let's first talk about the two conditions without warning. In this condition, the subject, we're told he has to initially select one of three squares. We did not tell the subject that if they select on the middle, they basically earn zero, expected value of zero. And if they select on the, on the borders, uh, they typically earn two, but if they select on this box there that they could not see, they will lose 40. So the expected va the subject did not see this line and did not see this box. They only see three boxes. And the probability, uh, but if they selected on the borders, they would, they would lose, the expected value would be negative. We had one condition, the border were very narrow. Another condition, the border were very large. Okay, and now the question, is what will be the outcome of uh, presenting a warning? So this was a, uh, the baseline condition, no warning. And now the question is what happens if we give them general warning? So in this condition they say, a uh, warning, clicking on a certain area can lead to a loss of 40 points. This area are marked in yellow. We don't tell them exactly where the loss is, but this is general. Again here. And this condition here, uh, we have focused warning. We tell them, um, we tell them uh, if you select here, you're going to lose, and here too. So what do you think? Is warning going to be effective here or backfire? So what we are trying to do is to predict under which situation the nudge that is a warning will backfire, under which situation will be effective. My assumption here, based on what I presented, but it's like that the warning change the subject behavior. Now they say, hey. Initially, I thought I have to select between three alternatives, but now when you give me a warning, now I have six alternatives. Either select the center here or the side here, the center here, the side here. And before the warning, they were not aware of the fact that, that there is a, a, a dangerous area. So the question is, under which condition a warning will backfire, if at all? And my argument is that the same logic that I presented to you the idea that people rely on small sample of past experience suggests that the warning will backfire here, but will be effective uh, in all other situations. But here, it will backfire. And why? The reason is that before the warning, in this experiment, the probability of selecting on the borders is very low. After the warning, they consider it. They consider it and they will try. Most of the time, they'll earn. Right? It's a rare event. It's only a 6% to lose the 40. So they will try it and say, oh, this is actually good. They, they warn me, but they lie. This was a sludge. It's a good idea to press on the warning, and then it will backfire. In this condition, it will not backfire because people will select uh, the borders. By the way, the box move in each trial from location to location. So in this condition, the warning will be effective because before the warning, they select the, bo the border many times and the warning will reduce it. In this condition, the warning should be effective because now if you once do the warned against behavior, immediately you lose. So if you, even if you rely on small sample, that will be okay. 
So the reliance on small sample hypothesis predicts that the warning will backfire here. But then now you have to rely to uh, understand that in this setting the warning changes the strategy space, unlike the other situations. So the model I presented below here will not be good because the model I presented before was only for situation in which the set of strategy is not affected by the description. And if in the border areas that are not the dangerous areas, you earn two. Right, but you earn more on average than you earn in the interior. Well, but this move from place to place. So on average, when you press on the order, you lose. If you are if you're lucky enough not to press this area, you're doing well. But you don't know where this area is. It's move from try to try. Better than if you consistently yes. Yeah, it's better to, uh, no, in this experiment, in this case, it's better to select inside. But on, but in, uh, but most of the time, pressing here is good because you only lose, you lose 40, but only 6% of the trial. And uh, our results suggest, uh, support this story. So basically, in the narrow task, without warning, uh, Without warning, we had a small uh, accident rate. This is a proportion of time the loss 40. Without warning, it was low. And once you have a general warning, it increases the accident rate. The warning backfired. But in this situation, it did not backfire because the proportion of selecting the border was large enough. And now when you give the warning, it only helps. OK, so this was uh, just, this is not, if you didn't follow me here, I three hours, don't worry about it. Here's a summary, and the summary is going to be simple. This is just for, uh, for boundary condition. So I'm not suggesting I have a general model for everything. Here is one boundary condition. So my model might is likely to be effective when you know the strategy space. When you don't know the strategy space, that could be a problem. Yes? Did they know that they could earn money at some other point instead of like only zero? Or did they know that they could get zero at some point? Well, we didn't tell them anything, but when they select the middle, they get on average zero. But they knew that they could also win, get positive. We didn't. We didn't somewhere. tell them anything. Okay. Okay. So here is a summary. Uh, I try to argue. This is a, my main story here. That uh, the gap between the usefulness and the violation of the rationality assumption cannot be explained by just assuming that uh, experience trigger. Uh, maximization. So in the 90s, I used to think that that's a problem with uh, psychologists and behavioral economists as they study contrived experiments, abstract. And once people get experiments, that economic theory will, uh, will capture behavior well. This is not the case. There are situations that even after people gain experience, they don't learn to maximize. The good news is that we know when this is happening. So our results suggest that experience trigger maximization only when the optimal choice also minimizes the probability of regret. So if we are in the business of developing mechanism to help create a better world, this is one trick that we can use. Maybe there are more tricks than, than this. This is one trick that we discover. Maybe there are more tricks. But my main point is that when you look back on things like the Prosbol correction and say, here, you know, Hillel was a smart man. Uh, he did the backwards induction and he find a solution. This is great, but it doesn't mean that every time that we do the backwards induction, this will work. What it works there because in his setting, the rational behavior was also better most of the time, and this is why it survived two hundred two thousand years. So I'm think what I'm thinking is that if you are in the business of mechanism design, uh, uh, mechanism design that assume rational choice are likely to be useful when they ensure that the desired behavior maximizes return and also uh, minimize the probability of regret. And uh, so this is a uh, good news. And the bad news is suggesting I'm not having a, I don't have a precise model of human cognition or the underlying processes. I'm thinking that maybe the underlying processes are really complex machine learning algorithm. So we will not be able to come up with a perfect model of the underlying processes. But in static settings, like the situation I study, then we can predict behavior really well. What happened in dynamic settings, it will be more complex. I'm still uh, not sure. But, uh, but we, but, uh, but we can, in static setting, we can, we can have a simple model that all that they have to assume is some overgeneralization, 
some relates on small sample and some surprise trig and change effect. With these things, we can actually predict behavior quite well in this setting. And my hope is that this method will be help, will also help predict under which the long-term effect of nudge, for example. Definitely the long-term effect of incentive, that's pretty clear. Now, of course, if you are in the business of uh, actually policy making, you also have to worry about another thing for which behavioral economics may be more interesting. Uh, but so I have, no, I don't have more time. So let's stay with this. <laughs> Let me just finish this last sentence. <laughs> I think, uh, but this will be only one sentence. So I think there's a really interesting, uh, another interesting open question. The most important open question, I think, in behavior economics is what is populism? So all these policies can work, uh, but sometimes policy makers don't want to do it because the public will not like it. So this is another challenge. And maybe, uh, and this is not a challenge. That, this is a challenge that I want to study in the future. Because I already noticed that in some of the methods that I propose here, uh, policymakers don't want to implement. Seatbelt works fine, but uh, some of them are not as, some of my ideas are not, uh, doesn't sound good to some of the parties. Okay, thank you.